see this now. Um, so today um, we're going to be talking about enforcing and evolving the schema with Delta Lake. Uh, this is part two of our diving into Delta Lake series. And my name is Andreas Neumann and uh, my co-host is Danny Lee. So very quick introduction about myself. I'm a software engineer at Databricks. I dedicate uh, almost all of my time to Delta Lake and also to how you can build data pipelines with Delta. Um, I have been doing this for quite a while. I've been building uh, pipelines on Spark since 2014. And I've formally done that uh, at other places like Google Cloud, uh, a startup called Cast Data, um, Yahoo, and IBM. Um, I'm originally from Germany, and so that's why my, uh, my computer science degrees are also from German universities that you've probably never heard of. But um, with this, I'll, I'll pass it to Danny to introduce himself. Hey, thank Andreas. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate uh, at Databricks. I've been working with Apache Spark since uh, 0.5, 0 0.6 days. Uh, before this, I was the senior director of data science engineering at Concur, and I'm also a former Microsofty, uh, being up here in the Seattle area. Woohoo! Go Hawks! That's right. I called it out, everybody. Uh, so as a Microsofty, I was involved with the Cosmos DB team, HD Insight, uh, Isotope, and also with the SQL Server team. Uh, so I'm a longtime database guy. So hence the reason why Delta Lake is awesome. And then um, I have a master's in biomedical informatics at OHSU. And uh, I'm not as interesting as Andreas. I just have a BS in uh, physiology at McGill. Uh, basically, Asian parents were supposed to be a doctor. It uh, turned out that was a really bad idea. So there you go. <laughs> I think that's very interesting, though. <laughs> OK, so um, for another time, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just a very quick recap. Uh, last week, um, we discussed the transaction log of Delta. And just in case you missed this, I, I highly recommend that you catch up on this. Uh, the video is on YouTube and uh, we'll uh, post the link uh, later on. Um, so let's go to um, the topic of today's talk. Um, what we're going to talk about is that data is constantly evolving and constantly changing, right? Why is that? Because it reflects all the things that we experience. It reflects the business problems and the business requirements that we have. So as those change, the structure of our data changes, right? Now, when that happens, we want to um, have predictability, right? We want to be in control of how that happens. And it turns out that Delta Lake makes that very easy. Um, Delta Lake um, has good ways to control how schema changes and also very good ways of enforcing schema. So um, what exactly is schema enforcement? Enforcement, and that's also often called validation, um, simply means that it prevents us from accidentally writing bad data to our table, writing data to our table that is not compatible with its schema or with its structure. Um, but when we actually want to change the schema of the table, then we can use schema evolution. And that allows us to change the schema going forward in a very controlled way. So what is a table schema? Um, the table schema describes the structure of our data. Right? In Apache Spark, for example, um, every data frame has a schema. And if you use Delta Lake as your storage format, then the schema of that data becomes the schema of the table and it is saved in a JSON format inside the transaction log. We saw the transaction log last week, right? And what does this schema look like? So it's, it's basically, it's, uh, it's a list of fields, right? Um, um, each field has a name, oops. Um, each field has a type. And it'll also say whether it's nullable, right? If it's nullable, that means the field doesn't have to be present. Um, but if nullable is false, then every record that's written to the table is required to have this, uh, this column or this field. Okay, so knowing what a schema is, let's talk about what schema enforcement is. Schema enforcement 
also known as schema validation, um, rejects any writes to a table that do not match the table schema. So what does that mean? Well, it happens on write, right? Anytime I write, I overwrite, I append to a table, uh, schema enforcement is applied. And if the schema of the data that I'm writing is not compatible with the schema of the table, then Delta Lake will cancel the transaction. Right? That means no data is written, and this is atomic, right? You never have a case where some data gets written. Either your entire transaction goes through or it gets canceled. And also, um, Delta Lake will throw an exception, and your basically your job will fail, and so you know that there was a mismatch. Now, what are the rules of schema enforcement? Um, so the data that you're writing to the table cannot contain any additional columns. Right? If I have any column that isn't present in the, in the table schema, then the table will not accept this data. Um, it's OK, on the other hand, if the data that I'm writing does not contain all the columns. Right? Some of the columns uh, can be missing. And then what happens is in that data that I'm writing, these columns will be assigned null values. Um, and that's OK, but um, it's not OK if those columns are not nullable. Right? And uh, a lot of you have probably heard that it's a very good practice to always make all fields nullable because that allows you to do, um, uh, to be more flexible with the, with the data that you write to a table. Um, in addition, you cannot have columns that have a different data type than what's defined in the table schema. Right? So for example, if my table says, oh, this column has type string, but the data that I'm trying to write has type integer, then schema enforcement will fail this write, and it will throw an exception, and no writes will happen. Another um, pretty important uh, and tricky case here is you cannot have column names that differ from the table schema only by case. So what does that mean? Let's say you have a um, you have a column foo with a capital F, then you cannot have another column where the F is um, is a is a, a small caps letter. And why is that? There's a little bit of background here. So um, this is about whether your jobs are case sensitive or case insensitive. So Spark can do either. Um, but Parquet, which is the default storage format of Delta Lake, is always case sensitive. And um, Delta, because it wants to be able to deal with both of this, is case preserving. So it'll simply pass through the case that you give it. But when it stores the schema, you, it, it won't allow you to have two columns that have the same name uh, except for case. And this is simply to prevent like potential mistakes and to prevent unexpected things that, that might happen to your data um, if you're not aware of the, of the case sensitivity issues. All right, so that was schema enforcement. And, and why is schema enforcement useful? What are, what are um, situations where I need this, right? And this is it's basically any time when I run production systems that really depend on the fixed structure of the data that they're reading, right? So for example, machine learning algorithms, when I'm training my model, it expects uh, an ex exact kind of, of data there. And if that data changes, then I don't even know what that model means. Um, BI dashboards, um, pretty much any data analytics and visualization tools. And any production system that expects a highly structured and strongly typed uh, schema. Um, so in order to do that, um, because your data typically arrives um, in your data center or in the cloud um, with schema variation, a lot of people um, build pipelines that sort of employ a multi-hop approach. So the first hop will just like ingest raw data, the next one will filter out bad data, and the next one might canonicalize the schema so that like in the end when you have your gold tables, um, all the records in those tables conform to the expected schema. Okay, so now that we've talked about schema enforcement, um, let's talk about evolution, right? So schema enforcement was a, uh, was a way that 
allows us to fix the schema of our data. Schema evolution allows us to change uh, the schema of our data in a very controlled way. All right, so it allows you to change a table schema to accommodate for data that has been changing over time. All right, and most commonly, this is used for operations like append and override. And in order to do that in, uh, in Spark with Delta Lake, you use an option, and that option is called merge schema. And you just add that option to your write statement. Um, there's also a way to do this through a Spark configuration. Uh, you set the uh, Spark Databricks Delta schema dot auto merge to true. Um, however, so if you do this, you have to be aware that um, schema enforcement will, will no longer apply, right? So now when you start writing data to your table that has additional columns, for example, the schema of your table will change. And so you need to be know knowing what you're doing. Okay. So with this option, merge schema as true, we can basically make any schema changes that are read compatible. And what does read compatible mean? It means that existing data in the table can still, still be read according to the new schema, right? And so we do this when we append or overwrite the table and the following types of changes are, are available here. So we can add new columns. Right? Um, and the old data, in the old data that's already in the table, those columns will simply be null. Um, we can change the type of, of a column from non-nullable to nullable. Right? So that's basically, that's a relaxation of the, of the existing schema. Right? And so the old data will still fit. Um, and we can do upcasts, right? where we go from a smaller type to a bigger type. So, any byte can be represented as a short, a short can be represented as an integer. So the old data can still be read. Um, there is a somewhat stronger form of schema evolution. And um, for this form of evolution, you would use the option override schema. And that allows us to do schema changes that are not read compatible with the existing data. So typically we do this when we overwrite the data. Right? Because if we only append, then the old data in the table becomes useless. But if we overwrite all data, then um, we can change the schema. So what types of schema changes can we make um, here? So we could drop a column, for example, or we could change the data type of a col column. Right? So something that was previously a string can now be an integer. And that wasn't possible with merge schema. And we can also rename columns. And even if we just change the case of columns, this is all now allowed um, if we do override schema. Um, so just one more note. Um, in Spark 3, there will also be um, DDL syntax that allows you to alter the schema uh, of a table. Um, and that's going to be called the alter table statement. Um, so this concludes uh, this part of the, the introduction. And uh, I'm going to proceed with a demo. Second. And OK, so everybody should be able to see uh, my notebook now. Um, so I'm going to use this notebook to demonstrate how schema enforcement and how schema evolution work. And um, I, would, uh, uh, I would like to say that you can actually try this yourself. Um, all these demos, uh, all, uh, excuse me. Um, so um, all this will be available for you. You can try and run these notebooks um, in your own uh, clusters and Databricks. And if you don't have a Databricks account, you can use Databricks Community Edition, right? And um, all of this will be available after this uh, webinar. The data that we're using here is actually public data and it's from um, a website called Lending Club. And it, it basically describes loans that were funded uh, during a certain time. Um, okay.
Here's a very quick intro of Delta Lake, and I am not going to go through all of this. Uh, the, the two things that are important to us here um, in this talk is that it's asset transactions. So we know that writes either go through or they, or they fail. And uh, so our data will always have integrity. Um, and the really important part here is the schema enforcement and the schema, schema evolution. We will also do a little bit of looking at the history of a table and doing a little bit of time travel just to play around with the schemas at different um, time uh, times. Mm. Okay, so to begin with, um, we want to show how this was would look like if you did not have Delta Lake. So Delta Lake uses Parquet files as its default storage format. And so let's just um, play with some data just with um, Parquet. And uh, the first thing uh, we're going to do here is we're going to download uh, this data. OK, so the data is now here. It's in this uh, particular location here. Um, and it was downloaded to this location. And that's uh, the data that we're going to be working with now. So um, the, the first thing uh, I'm doing here is just a little bit of setup, uh, importing a couple of things and setting some options um, and, and creating a, a working directory for uh, this experiment. OK. And so that has happened. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm going to create a parquet table. Right? And the way I'm going to create this is I'm going to read this data that we just downloaded. Um, and I'm not going to do much with it. I'm just going to write it, um, write it back using Parquet uh, format. And then we're going to create a view over this data. And this view will allow us to uh, run SQL queries over that data. So this is now running. OK, so this went pretty quickly. And uh, if we look at this uh, table now, let's uh, just look at the first 20 records here. Um, we can see that this table uh, has a schema, right? It, uh, every row here has a loan ID. Uh, it has a funded amount. Uh, they all appear to be 1,000. Um, and then it has the paid amount. This is how much has been paid off. Um, and then it also has the state um, where this loan was funded. And um, this looks pretty uniform and, and pretty good data. Um, let's see how many records are in this table. Um, so we're doing this with a simple SQL count query. And that was fast, uh, 14,705. OK, so this is the number of records that are in this data set. And um, now we want to um, take this table and we, we want to append more data to it. Right? And in order to do that, we're going to run uh, a streaming query. We're going to do structured streaming. And uh, this stream that we're going to run is going to generate random data that also has uh, loan IDs and loan amounts. Right? So for this, um, I'm just defining a, a couple of utility functions here. Um, here's something um, that generates a state randomly. Um, the, the main method here is this one. right? So what it does is it uses uh, the Spark format rate. What, so what rate does is it simply generates rows. Um, every second it generates, I think here, it generates five rows. And uh, each row will have a timestamp and a value. And then we can use those things to create new columns from that. right? So here we, we take the, um, that value and add 10,000 to it. And then we have a new loan ID um, and so on. So we're basically generating these four columns here. Uh, that were in the schema of the table that we saw up here. OK, so yeah, so this looks pretty much like the same data, same kind of data. And then uh, we, we start a query that simply, um, as a streaming query, uh, keeps writing to that, uh, to that table every 10 seconds. All right, so, um, and I'm also defining a utility to stop my streams when I'm done with them. All right, so let's run this query. All right, so this should now, every 10 seconds, um, it should uh, add some data. Let's look at this uh, query. It's running. It's still initializing, it seems. Um, but pretty soon, we should be seeing some change here. OK, so now it's processing data. We can see that here. And so let's look at this table. 
let's uh, count the number of records in the table. Okay, so it looks like it has written some data and it, it should actually be adding more and more data. Yeah, we see that the number of records in this table is steadily going up. So it looks like this streaming query is working and it does what it's supposed to do. But wait, we had 14,705 rows in this table and where, where did those go? I suddenly only have 145. This is weird. Well, let's look at this data again. Um, let's see. So let's just look at a few of the records. Um, okay. Oh my, yeah. So I see that somehow my data is different. This data has different schema. It has two extra columns. Um, it has a timestamp and it has a value. Okay. So where, where do these come from? Uh, it's, it's, that, this is confusing, but let's see. Well, let's look at, let's look at this code again. And to, if, if we look at this closely, we see that it uses this format that's called rate and that creates these two columns. And when we say with column, then we add more columns to that, but we never drop those two columns. And that's why we now have a schema that has two additional columns. Well, with, with this, we now have two kinds of data in the table. We have some data that has four columns, some data that has six columns. And in Parquet file format, it's really a very unpredictable what's going to happen and how Spark is going to read that data. And it turns out that this can lead to data loss because Spark will simply ignore some of those, um, some of those files that are in the table. So um, this didn't work very well, right? And now I want to show you how Delta Lake can protect us from this kind of situation where we are unknowingly dropping data. Okay, so we're gonna do a, a very similar setup as we did for Parquet, but this time we're just gonna do it with Delta, right? So we're reading this, um, this file again that we downloaded, but now we're writing it in format Delta and we're writing it to a different path. And again, we're creating um, a temporary view so that we can query this with SQL. Um, so let's look at this data one more time. Okay, so it has 14,705 rows. That's exactly what we expected. And if we look at some of the records, yeah, they look exactly the same that they looked like when we, uh, when we did Parquet. So just as a, um, a quick deep dive into how uh, Delta Lake stores the schema. Let's look at the files that are actually in the directory that represents this table. So here we have a parquet file and this is the one that was written. Um, but we also have an extra directory that's the Delta log and the Delta log contains uh, Delta's transaction log. So let's look at the files that are here. So this should contain commits because we've only run one little batch job um, against this, there's only a single commit and that commit is represented by this JSON file. All right, so let's uh, look at this JSON file. What does this look like? Okay, so this is, this is pretty uh, complex JSON. Um, let's, let's look at this in a different way because Spark has a way to read this as JSON. Okay, now we can see the structure of this and we can see that this is a pretty um, nested and pretty rich JSON structure. It has an add field, which says what information was added in this commit. It has a general commit info, and it also has metadata and a protocol. So let's look, uh, look at these things in detail. Um, the first one we're looking at is the commit information. Um, so this commit um, apparently was written on a cluster with this ID. Um, we can see what the isolation level was. We can see the ID of the notebook that we're in. If you look at my header here, uh, you can see that this is indeed the ID of my notebook. And uh, we can see a timestamp and we can see my user ID and my email address. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, that gives us a lot of information. Now let's look at uh, what information was added, what data was added in this commit. And what we see here is there was data change. There is a modification timestamp. We also have a path and this path matches what we saw in the directory listing up here, right? That's exactly this path that belongs to this commit. 
and we see some stats, right? So the statistics help. Um, the statistics help uh, Delta optimize queries, and we see that these statistics exist for all the four columns, right? The loan ID, the funded amount, the paid amount, and the and the state. Now let's look at the metadata. And a metadata is actually very interesting. If we look at this, we see that um, it has a creation time and it has the format of the file, but more, most importantly, it has the schema string. So this is um, a parquet or an Avro um, schema string, and it describes exactly the fields that are in this table, right? So there's a loan ID, there's a funded amount, there's a paid amount, and there's the state. Okay. So now we know how, how Delta records the schema of a table uh, in its metadata. Let's run a streaming count on this table because what we're gonna do next is we're gonna start appending more data to this table. And so running this streaming count will um, continuously count the table and update these counts in real time. And um, the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna write, um, data in the same way that we wrote it to Parquet. Um, this is the same function that we called previously. It's just using table format delta now. Okay, and what we see here is that we get an analysis exception, right? So Spark refuses to run this query and, it's, and why does it do that? Because the table schema doesn't match, right? And it actually tells us the difference between the two schemas, right? It's these, it's these two columns. Well, that's good, right? So we, we just saw schema enforcement at work, right? It prevented us from appending incompatible data to the schema. Well, this was great. Um, now let's fix the streaming query, right? So now we know that we have to fix this query because it's, it's incompatible. So one thing we can do is we can just simply add a, pro a projection um, uh, as the last statement in the query, which selects only the four columns that we're interested in, yeah? So um, let's define this and uh, run it again with the modified query. So now as this query is running, um, remember we started this query up there that is constantly counting how many records are in the table. So let's look at the status of this thing. And um, let's see. So this should now update the counts. And there we go. Now we see there's more records in the table and the counts are actually going up, right? We didn't start over at zero like we did with Parquet. Oh, this is nice. I like it. All right, so just for sanity, let's also run a batch query. And yeah, we also see this has a, a larger count, right? Uh, the nice thing about Delta is you can have many concurrent jobs running against the same table. They will not conflict with each other. They don't get in, get in each other's way and they can be streaming and batch and you can mix them as you like. All right, so schema enforcement worked and um, now we're gonna stop the streams for this and we're gonna try to do some experimentation with schema evolution. Okay, so um, before I do this, I just want to remember how many commits I had in this table. So the last commit in this table after I ran that last query was number seven. Okay. And we can see that if we list, we see that in the Delta log, there are actually exactly seven commits. Okay. So we're going to remember this number seven. And uh, now again, we're going to run the streaming count to see the counts updating in real time. Now, let's start this query again. That uh, should actually uh, should actually fail, right? Yeah. So we saw this, right? It failed. And um, let's look again at the uh, at the actual error. And so the error tells us the schemas are different, but it also gives us a hint here. It says, well, if you want to have schema migration, which is another term for schema evolution, uh, use this option. So let's, let's try that. Let's do that and modify our query to use this option, right? And so here we're just modifying this function to add one option, merge schema equals true. 
And uh, then we're going to try this again. Um, all right. So this query is initializing. It's now running. And let's go up here to the streaming count and let's see um, what's happening here. So we're counting. Oh, this query failed. And why did this fail now? Oh, it detected a schema change. So it, it detected that there's two additional columns in the table. This is interesting, right? So when the schema changes, we have to restart our, our streaming query because we can't just dynamically change the schema while it's running. And the error message actually tells us, hey, why don't you try restarting the query? This will refresh the schema, and then it should work again. So let's try running this, um, this count again. And um, so when we start this as a new query, then uh, it should work. So let's uh, look at this. And um, yeah, so now it can count. And we should see the counts going up. In the meantime, I'm also going to do a batch query just to see that, uh, yeah, that matches, right? The counts here go up. And the counts here have also been higher. So we saw that um, schema evolution worked, right? The moment that I added merge schema as an option, um, I was actually able to dynamically change the schema as the shape of my data changed. All right, so after we've seen this, I'm going to stop my streams again. And by the way, if you run this on Community Edition, make sure you always stop the streams when it's in the notebook, because otherwise you might quickly run out of quota in your, in your clusters. All right, so now after we've done this schema evolution, let's um, take a look at the history of this table and how it changed over time as the schema changed. So we'll look at all the files again. We see that there's a bunch of, of new commits now, right? Um, so here, number seven, that was the last commit that I had before I started schema evolution, right? And we see there's a two minute gap here. So commit number eight, um, I would think, must be the first commit that has the schema change, right? And then from nine on, all these commits must have the new schema. So um, we can also see this in the Delta table history. Delta actually has an API that lets you see the history. And here we can nicely display that. Um, we can see all the commits and we can see their timestamp. We can see things like the query ID, the notebook ID. And an interesting thing that we can see here is um, between commit number seven and commit number eight, the query ID is changing. And why is that? Because here I started writing with a new query, right? And this is also when I started writing with a new schema. Okay, so now let's take a closer look at the um, actual commit points that are in this transaction log, right? And um, for this, I'm just gonna, um, so I remembered earlier the, the commit number before my schema change, I think it was seven, right? And so I'm just adding one for this to get the schema change itself. And then everything after that should, uh, which is nine and greater, should have the new schema. Um, and now that I have this, I'm just gonna read this three, these three commits um, into a, a JSON format. And then I'm, we can look at these commits in detail. So first let's look at the commit before the schema change. Um, what we see here is it has a, has a bunch of data changes, right? And if we look at an individual one, we can see it has, yeah, 32 records in this file, and it has statistics for the four fields that were in the table before the schema change, right? So that's exactly what we expected. And now we look at the commit that made the, the, the schema change. Um, what does this look like? OK, so this also has a data change. But wait, this is a data change, but it has zero records. Like, why, why are there no records in this commit if it says there's a data change? Hmm. Well, the, the beef of this commit is actually in its metadata. right? And to see what really happened in this commit is we have to look at the metadata. And if we look at the metadata, we will see that this commit has a schema 
And in this schema, we have the two new fields. We have the timestamp and we have the value, right? So what we see here is that when we do schema evolution, Delta Lake adds, it basically adds an empty commit point that all it does is change the schema, but it doesn't really add data, right? And now we can look at the next commit. We can look at the data that it added. And um, this now again has um, uh, records in the files that it wrote. And it also has statistics for the new fields. So we can tell that, yes, this was writing with a new schema. All right, so Delta did exactly what we wanted. It recorded the schema change at the right point in time in its transaction log. Now, from last week, we know that we can do time travel using the transaction log, right? We can go back to previous versions of the table and see what its state was then, right? And, and we kind of, we remembered a couple of, um, of, of commit versions. And um, so let's just look at three different uh, points in time in this table. The first one will be like the version when we initialized the table. Yeah, that was the first time we wrote to it. And then the second one will be the version of the table just before the schema change. And the third one will be now, the latest version of that table. And if we count all the records at all these three different times, we will see that, um, yeah, initially it was 14,705. At the time of schema change, we had more. And now the current version has even more records in it. And that was exactly what we expected. The nice thing is we can actually also look at the data. And um, if we look at the data, even though the schema of the table has changed, right? So our schema now includes two additional fields. These two fields um, were not present in this commit, right? In C underscore before, that was number seven. So if we read this data now, um, we will still see the old data and we will see it with the old schema. Right, so um, this is nice, right? Because if we go back in history, we don't just see the old data at that time, but we actually see it with the schema that it had at that time. Um, now we go to the time just before the schema changed. And if we look at this data, it's still, uh, no, this is the time when the schema changed, right? This is exactly commit number eight. And uh, what we see now is, that we see the old data, right? This is exactly the same data that we saw before. But now we see two additional columns. All the values here are, are null. And why is that? Because we haven't written any data that actually has these columns, right? And so they default to the null value. And this is, this is exactly what we expected. Now, if we go to the latest version of this table, or even if we just go to the first version of the table right after the schema change, right? This was commit after. Um, then we will actually find records where the timestamp is not now. And we will, we will see that here. You see here. And so now we have um, actual data with a new schema where uh, the new columns do not default to null. Um, yeah, so this was all I wanted to show in this demo. Um, I'm going to go back to my uh, presentation. And uh, conclude the presentation. So one thing you might wonder is if I now switch my storage format to Delta, I have all my existing applications. So will I just easily be able to still use that data. And the, and the good news is that there are plenty of tools that have connectors for Delta Lake. So if you are using Hive or Spark or Presto, um, even if you're in the cloud, you're on Redshift, Athena, Snowflake, there's, there's a multitude of tools that have connectors for Delta and can actually operate on Delta data. Um, there's also a lot of partners that will um, help you uh, or allow you to use Delta in their, in their tools, right? And so there's um, um, a lot more than these, but uh, what stands out here is we have a lot of um, analytics companies. We have 
Um, we have data ingestion companies, and we also have the big cloud vendors, right? Google Data Proc supports this. Azure Synapse uh, supports this. And so pretty much no matter where you are, you will find partners who will support you in using Delta. And if that hasn't convinced you, there is a, a bunch of, of companies that are already using Delta. And it's, it's a lot more than the ones shown here. This is just a little sample. Um, so if you want to join the club and also start using Delta, then ask yourself this question, how do I use it? Well, it's, it's very easy. So if you have existing Spark jobs or Spark notebooks or PySpark Py, Py notebooks, um, all you need to do is you need to add Delta to your packages or to your dependencies. So either you do that on the command line for PySpark or the Spark shell, um, or you do that in Maven if, uh, if, if you have a Maven job. And the moment you've done that, um, you can just switch anything that previously was Parquet. You can now use Format Delta there. That is the only line of code that you need to change and everything else will just work. Um, if you want to learn more, um, this is part of a whole series of talks. And I encourage you to subscribe and visit us again next time. The URL is down here. And if you want to become part of the community and build your own Delta Lake, go to http delta.io. This is where the open source community lives. And with that, I want to open it up to questions. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Andreas. That's, that was an excellent presentation. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes or so to answer questions. So I'm going to start with answering some of the Q&A here to give Andreas a little time to breathe. Andreas, meanwhile, also refer to the Q&A questions. Or if you'd like me to, I can ask various questions to you. Uh, that you know, for wh whichever one wh you like to do. But I will start with a quick question, um, which is uh, one person had asked the question, is schema evolution available in open source Delta Lake? And is there any difference between the Delta Lake in Databricks versus the open source Delta Lake? So as a quick call out, while we did this presentation in Databricks, this actually everything we're showing is actually open source available. There is actually no difference between, or I shouldn't say no difference, but the goal is as uh, as, as will be part of Delta Lake 1.0, there will be no difference between the open source uh, and ma or uh, managed Delta Lake, the, uh, the one that's with Databricks, because all of the APIs and those features are actually gonna be exactly the same, okay? So it doesn't, uh, the, that's the, absolutely the goal. The quick call out is that there are some potential differences for Databricks itself in terms of the management um, of it, uh, but in terms of the actual functionality and the APIs, no, there's going to be there actually is no difference. Um, and related to this question, there was a question concerning. Um, why didn't we do this using the SQL syntax? That's pr part of the reason why, because uh, once Spark 3.0 becomes available, we can show you running all of this in using the SQL syntax instead of using uh, the API syntax. It's it just that we were, we're dependent on some of the features that are specific to Spark 3.0 in order to be able to support that. Okay, so I just wanted to call that out. So, uh, Andreas, uh, would like me to ask, ask you some questions, or are there any questions inside here that uh, in the Q and A panel that that you particularly like? <laughs> yeah, I was just struggling with actually seeing the questions because while I'm presenting, I don't see them. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, no problem. So then, you know what? I will ask you some questions, and you can just tell me uh, if you'd like me to answer them, or if you want to go ahead and answer them. How's that? <laughs> sure. All right. So the the uh, the the quick call out is that. Um, if I understood this correctly, is our enforcement and evolution in this case mutually exclusive? They um, they are not mutually exclusive. It is uh, on a job to job basis. So if your job um, in in Spark, right, if it uses the option merge schema or override schema, then that job will be allowed to change the schema. Right? Other jobs where you don't give that option uh, might not be allowed to do that. Right? And those jobs will fail if they try to do that. Cool. 
Perfect. And then another question, which is uh, which you technically sort of answered, but I figured it'd be good just to call this out, right? Is does Delta Lake have a way to track the lineage? And this way specifically is uh, to know how the schema was, was stored in relation to the data. Yeah, I mean the lineage is implicit in each of the of the Delta Lake uh, commits in the transaction log, right? When we when we looked at this uh, JSON structure, we could see that every commit has lineage in it. It, it can tell you uh, what was the notebook ID, what was the Spark job ID, what was the user ID, what was the email of the user who did this, right? So when you look at a commit that performed the schema change, you can find all this information. Exactly. And, and just to add to your point, right, right, like for, don't forget that it, when you're working with Parquet, the Parquet itself contains the schema per se, but the problem, this is the reason why we have schema evolution and schema enforcement, which is to say that, okay, well, while Parquet can do it, the reality is that things can change over time. So you need something that actually has a transaction log that contains all of the potential changes that were uh, that way we have an enforcement capability that way we can evolve we can say exactly to the point of lineage we can see within the json itself uh, in the metadata column oh, okay uh version zero in the case this particular case this is where we went ahead and had the initial version of four columns by version was a seven or eight <laughs> that one is the where the switch made and then now it has six columns so you can actually see it within the transaction log itself basically uh, a fun one for you, Andreas. Uh, is it possible to, uh, relate to the time travel, is it possible to roll back to a certain point in history? Uh, it absolutely is, yes. Um, you, just, you just need to go back to that commit. You can read at any point in time. Absolutely. Cool. Uh, let's see. Here's uh, another one because we actually have a lot of them, which is basically supporting talking about schema, uh, supporting schema stuff. So I think you answered most of the questions. So I'm just trying to filter them out. <laughs> um, oh, right. Uh, I think we already answered this one. But again, I think it's a good call out in schema validation is a mismatch of the nullable field allowed. Uh, so a, a mismatch of a nullable field is not allowed if you try to write data that doesn't contain that field, then Delta Lake will throw an exception because it enforces that non-nullable, uh, no, that non-nullable fields are always there. If the field is nullable, then that's relaxing this restriction, right? And, and that means you can write data that doesn't have these columns. Cool. Uh, then re uh, related to that as well is that in terms of, because we've been talking about schema this entire time, does Delta Lake support schema less mode or is it always running with the schema? And I think you sort of answered that already with the first commit, but figured I we'd call this out. Yes, Delta always has a schema. Uh, De Delta is a schema on write storage format. Perfect. Okay. And then, all right. Now related to errors actually with Delta Lake. Uh, if for example, you're reading a message queue and then, uh, or, and you're writing to it and then Delta has an error, um, does it automatically replay it or sh do, do you actually have to handle the, the missing message? Now, note, this is more of a unpacking the transaction log question versus a schema question, but I figured it's still a good call out. And also it allows us to shamelessly call out that uh, do go to the playlist <laughs> and, and review the, the, the previous weeks unpacking the transaction log where we dive into it. But I figured at least I call that out right now. So. Yeah, that's right. So Delta will not automatically uh, replay this, right? It'll throw an exception and your job will fail. And, but the nice thing about Delta is that any of this data that you attempted to write, um, it's either all there or it's not there at all, right? So that means your write is atomic. And uh, so your data will always be consistent. You won't have phantom writes from like failed transactions or anything like that. Exactly. So just to add ex exactly to Andrea's point of view, uh, point here, um, it, we Delta Lake has optimistic, optimistic concurrency model, uh, concurrency, concurrency control model, excuse me. So if it's able to allow the right to happen, it will let it happen, right? So in other words, for example, if there's an error in which two um, 
threads are trying to write to, at the exact same time. There are uh, there are, are checks to say that, okay, well, you're trying to write at the same time, the same table, but actually it's okay because they're going to two different partitions. Okay, then there's actually errors that it will automatically retry for you right away and it'll take care of it. That, that's the optimistic concurrency control. But exactly to Andrea's point, if there's an error in which basically, no, it really is an error. There's no way for us to go ahead and process it automatically it'll go ahead and actually error out. And most importantly, it will not leave any partial written files. So exactly to Andrea's point about atom atomicity, it's either written or it isn't. So you can trust your data. This goes back to our theme of reliable data lakes. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, Let, I think we've got time for probably one more question. So uh, actually a good one that I, I sort of like talking about, this might, this might uh, go a little long, so, I, so we're, we'll have to make sure you and I both don't go too long on this one. Uh, <laughs> schema enforcement evolution usually comes at a performance cost. What's our take on this? Uh, why, why don't you take that, Danny? Oh, sure. Okay, no sweat. So the, the, the context of the evolution and enforcement, right, and from a performance perspective, it's actually what's being written to that transaction log, right? So the fact that you, number one, you actually have a transaction log, so there is a little bit of overhead for doing that. Number two, because we're actually going ahead and writing to, uh, to disk, the, the issue that you have, of course, is that as you can see with the transaction log or the fact that we can have different versions, every single version of the data with the, its different schema is actually written. So in other words, it's not like, uh, I believe, I, Andreas, we had 17 versions uh, by, by the yeah, time for the demo like was done, yeah. right. So you actually have te technically 17 versions of the data in there, okay? Uh, now, in this case, it was relatively simplistic because we could go ahead and it was, it was mostly additions. We didn't do any updates, we didn't do any inserts. So in this particular scenario, probably it wasn't that much of a performance hit because, uh, because of the fact that we're just simply adding two new columns and that means all the previous data was just nullable. So yay, it's not it really not that not much of an impact. But how about if you were to instead to do updates to that data or deletes, right? There, that means what is implied very strongly is that there's that many more versions of the data and those versions are much larger. So the, the potential performance impact is that you have that many more files. Now you can certainly run compaction to reduce the number of files, but the reality is you still have more data, okay? And so the, that's ultimately what the performance impact is. So it's less of a specific to schema enforcement and evolution per se, uh, outside of the transaction overhead, and more of the fact that you have that many more files to work with. That's where uh, the, the real performance hit's gonna be. And I, just to add to that, um, one important distinction here is whether you use merge schema or override schema. Because merge schema basically says that um, your old data is still read compatible with the new schema. So you don't need to rewrite any of the old data, right? And you just keep it in the table. And when you read that um, data at read time, you can easily morph it into the new schema. So th that just happens on the fly and there's almost no performance penalty. Whereas if you do an override schema, then you, you're basically forced to rewrite to make a new copy of all your existing data because otherwise you would not be able to read that back. And that's a huge performance penalty. And, and this is why typically the, the recommendation is to do a read compatible uh, schema evolution because that it, it's it just operationally is, is easier to handle. Perfect. Okay, well, you know what? Um, I, wa I wanna be cognizant of time. So um, I apologize for any questions that we could not answer, but I hope you definitely enjoyed today's session and we'll let head, head right, uh, we wanna thank Andreas, but let it head, head back to right to Karen. So let her uh, end the show. <laughs> and I wanna thank everybody for attending. Yeah, thanks so much, Andreas. Uh, great presentation. Um, thanks, Denny, as well, for joining us. Uh, and thanks, everyone uh, out there um, for joining us. Uh, just a quick call out to, I posted the YouTube links to subscribe and then also to join our online uh, meetup group. So I think those are the best places uh, for you to get notified on all of our upcoming tech talks and, and all the good stuff we have planned coming up in uh, the next few months. So thanks, everyone, again, for joining and uh, have a great rest of your day.